Heavenly Father, you are great. You are fantastic. You are our reason for living. And the only reason we have life, Lord, is you, because you gave it to us, Lord. And not only life, but abundant life through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask now as we lift you up in worship that you would quicken our hearts, Lord. Help us to concentrate on you because this time is about you, Lord. Lifting you up, praising you, giving you glory for what you have done. We ask that you would bless us tonight, Lord. That your word would pierce our hearts and show us how we should live. Thank you, and we lift this time up to you now and consecrate it in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Tonight, we're going to be in the letter of 1 John, chapter 1. This letter was written toward the end of the first century, around the year 90 A.D. The purpose of this letter was to expose the false teachers, witness to the humanity of Christ, and give believers a firm assurance of their salvation. Even in the first century, while some of the disciples were still alive and Jesus was a living memory, there were many false teachers. Paul warned the church in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 31, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch. And remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. The false teaching that John wants to address in this letter, 1 John, is called Gnosticism. To understand the scriptures, we need to have a basic knowledge of the Gnostic beliefs during the first century A.D. For, the back, for this background information, I will be loosely quoting from the Daily Bible Study series of William Barclay. It is clear that at the back of the pastoral epistles, there is some heresy which is endangering the church. Right at the beginning, it will be well to try to see what this heresy is. We will therefore collect the facts about it now. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, we read, As I urged you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus, so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, not to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. This passage of scripture brings us face to face with two of the Gnostic heresies characteristics. It dealt in idle tales or myths and endless genealogies. These two things were not peculiar to this heresy, but were deeply ingrained in the thought of the ancient world. First, the idle tales. One of the characteristics of the ancient world was that the poets and even the historians loved to work out romantic and fictitious tales about the foundation of cities and of families. They would tell how some god, so-called god, came to earth and founded the city or took in marriage some mortal maid and founded a family. For example, some of you may have heard that Romulus and Remus, the twin sons of either the god Mars or the demigod Hercules, founded the city of Rome. The ancient world was full of stories like that. Second, the endless genealogies. The ancient world had a passion for genealogies. We can see that even in the Old Testament with his chapters 
of names that are very hard to pronounce. <laughs> and in the New Testament with the genealogies of Jesus with which Matthew and Luke begin their Gospels. A man like Alexander the Great had a completely artificial pedigree constructed in which he traced his lineage back on one side to Achilles and Andromache on the other, and to the other side to Perseus and Hercules. It would be the easiest thing in the world for Christianity to get lost in endless and fabulous stories about origins and in elaborate and imaginary genealogies. That was a danger which was inherent when Christian thought was developing. The heresy of Gnosticism was entirely speculative. It began with the problem of the origin of sin and of suffering. They reasoned if God is altogether good, and they are inherently bad, he could not have created them. How then did they get into the world? The Gnostic answer was that creation was not creation out of nothing before time and matter existed. They believed that this matter was essentially imperfect and evil thing, and out of this essentially evil matter the world was created. So the Bible teaches that God made the earth and the whole universe out of what? Nothing. But the Gnostics taught that this matter existed and that's how God formed the world. So, wrong. No sooner had they got this to this length than they ran into another difficulty. If matter is essentially evil and God is essentially good, God could not himself have touched this matter. So they began another set of speculations. They said that God put out an emanation and that this emanation put out another emanation and that the second emanation put out a third emanation and so on and so on until there came into being an emanation so distant from God that he could handle matter and that it was not God but this emanation who created the world. They just made this stuff up. They went further. They held that each successive emanation knew less about God so that there came a stage in the series of emanations where the emanations were completely ignorant of him and more, there was a final stage when the emanations were not only ignorant of God but actively hostile to him. So they arrived at the thought that the God who created the world was quite ignorant of and hostile to the true God. Later, they went even further and identified the God of the Old Testament with this creating God and the God of the New Testament with the true God. They further provided each one of the emanations with a complete biography, and so they built up an elaborate mythology of gods and emanations, each with his story and his biography and his genealogy. There is no doubt that this ancient world was riddled with that kind of thinking and that it even entered the church itself. It made Jesus merely the greatest of the emanations, the one closest to God. It classed him as the highest link in the endless chain between God and man. Since Gnosticism was highly speculative, it was therefore intensely intellectually snobbish. It believed that all this intellectual speculation was quite beyond the mental grasp of ordinary people and was for just a chosen few, the elite of the church. As in today's masonry and many supposedly Christian cults, Jehovah Witness comes to mind, Mormonism, you have to be indoctrinated into this hidden knowledge for example, Mormon, Mormonism doesn't come right out and say, hey, if you're a man, you can be a god of your own planet and have all these spiritual lives and raise spirit babies. They don't tell you that, but that's what Mormonism is. So it's hidden knowledge. You don't get to know it until they got you hooked 
and then you start to receive your hidden indoctrination. The danger of Gnosticism was not only intellectual, it had serious moral and ethical consequences. We must remember that its basic belief was that matter was essentially evil and that the spirit alone was good. That resulted in two opposite results. They reasoned if matter is evil and the body is evil, the body must be despised and held down. Therefore, one of the results of Gnosticism was a rigid asceticism. It forbade, forbade men to marry, for the instincts of the body were to be suppressed. It laid down strict food laws, for the needs of the body must, as far as possible, be eliminated. So we find that in the pastoral letters, they speak of those who forbid to marry and who command to abstain from meats. But Gnostic doctrine also resulted in precisely the opposite ethical belief. If the body is evil, it doesn't matter what a man does with it. Therefore, let him sate his appetites. These things are of no importance. Therefore, a man can use his body in the most licentious way, and it makes no difference. So the pastoral letters also speak of those who lead away weak women until they are laden with sin and the victims of all kinds of lusts. Gnosticism had another consequence. The true Christian believes in the resurrection of the body. That is not to say that he ever believed that we are resurrected with this mortal human body, but... He always believed that after resurrection from the dead, a man would have a spiritual body provided by God. The scriptures teach that we're going to have a body like Jesus had, and he could be touched, he could be felt. Remember when he met with the disciples after the resurrection? The Gnostics held that there was no such thing as the resurrection of the body. After death, a man would be a kind of disembodied spirit. The basic difference is, is that the Gnostic believed in the body's destruction, the Christian believes in its redemption. The Gnostic believed in what he would call soul salvation, the Christian believes in whole salvation. Gnosticism also had its effect on the doctrine of the person of Jesus Christ. If matter was altogether evil, and if Jesus was the Son of God, then Jesus could not have had a flesh and blood body. So the Gnostic argued, he must have been a kind of spiritual phantom. So the Gnostic romances say that when Jesus walked, he left no footprints on the ground. This, of course, completely removed Jesus from humanity and made it impossible for him to be the savior of men. It was to meet this Gnostic false doctrine that John insisted on the flesh and blood body of Jesus and insisted that Jesus save men in the body of his flesh. So behind the pastoral epistles, there are these dangerous heretics who gave their lives over to intellectual speculation. They made it up. Who saw this as an evil world and the creating God as evil. Who put between the world and God an endless series of emanations and lesser gods and spent their time equipping each of them with an endless, fa endless fables and genealogies. They reduced Jesus to the position of a link in a chain and took away his uniqueness. The Gnostics lived either in a rigorous asceticism or an unbridled licentiousness. They denied the resurrection of a body it was their heretical beliefs that First John was written to combat. Now we should all have a little bit understanding of what Gnosticism is, what John was dealing with, so then we can understand the context of these verses because now we know what he was trying to do to, to combat and what their basic beliefs were. Please turn to First John chapter 1 where we read, What was from the beginning? What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This verse asserts that the word 
of life was from the beginning, from before time existed. As far back as you can think of the ages of eternity past, from be- before there was time, this word existed. The prophet Micah in chapter 5, verse 2 says, But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephratah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be the ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. John states that he is an actual eyewitness and participant in the events concerning the word of life. This word of life that John speaks of is none other than our blessed God and Savior, Jesus. This is clearly shown in the Gospel of John chapter 1, where John declares, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. John testified that he looked at and touched this word of life. He's an eyewitness of the physicality of Jesus. John's testimony would be allowed in any fair court of law. Jesus was no mere phantom or spirit being, as the Gnostics taught. He could be touched. He ate. He slept. He laughed, he cried, and did every other thing that we do in the same physical manner of all men. John saw it all firsthand. As we know from the Gospels, John lived with Jesus for nearly three years. He was intimate with him, and he saw it all. Verse 2, And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. To be manifested means to be shown clearly, for the understanding to be made known, to prove beyond doubt or question. John did not come to this knowledge at once. It took time. It took evidence. John wrote in his Gospel, chapter 1, There was the true light which, coming into the world, enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The things to do with Jesus are not based on speculation or spiritual mumbo-jumbo. He was no phantom. God does not expect or want us to believe based on blind faith. Our faith is a faith faith born of reason supported by facts. It's written in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. This faith in the promise of eternal life through Jesus was manifested over time and was revealed in the scriptures before the events occurred. Jesus didn't just show up on the scene and history unexpectedly, in history unexpectedly and unannounced. His coming was foretold through Moses and the Hebrew prophets. Jesus fulfilled many specific detailed prophecies that God offers as proof that his word is true. John's faith was based upon the scriptures and his eyewitness testimony of the true physical events concerning the life of Jesus. Verse 3 and 4. 
what we have seen and heard, we, pro we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. John's purpose in writing this letter is to give the reader first-hand testimony and the knowledge of Jesus, the word of life, so that in believing you may have life, you may be born again. Having fellowship not only with one another, but with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. This fellowship that John speaks of is a sharing, a communion, a common bond and life. It speaks of a living, breathing, sharing, loving relationship with another person. Christianity is not a religion. It is a close, loving, intimate relationship with the God of the universe. Our Christian fellowship speaks to our sharing resources and responsibilities with one another, just as in the early church. In Acts chapter 4, Luke writes, And the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him was his own, but all things were common property to them. And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and abundant grace was upon them all. For there was not a needy person among them, for all who were owners of land or houses would sell them and bring the proceeds of the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet, and they would be distributed to each as any had need. How about us? What's our attitude concerning our possessions, our homes, our money, and our time? Should we be selling all that we have and giving it to the poor and living with all things in common like the early church did? There is the record in Matthew chapter 19, verse 21, where Jesus instructs the rich young ruler that if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give them to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Should we do likewise? I do not believe that God is now calling us to sell all that we have and give it to the poor, or to have all things in common. The early church in Jerusalem was a special case situation where the church was just getting started and persecution was very intense. Because of their belief in Jesus, people were disowned and ostracized by their families. Some had their possessions seized. Some lost their jobs. So God called these believers to live in this manner because the survival of the church required it. The rich young ruler of Matthew 19 was told to sell all that he owned and give it to the poor because he had a self-righteous attitude that Jesus exposed by revealing what he truly worshipped, his riches. I, th I believe that where intense persecution exists, more sacrifice is required, and that during those times and situations, God will provide us with the necessary grace to carry out his will. The time is coming to our country when true Bible-believing Christians will be actively persecuted. The Constitution is ignored. Our freedom of speech is rapidly being eroded. The world looks at the truths found in the Word of God as fables, myths, and narrow-minded, bigoted hate speech. To the unbeliever, good is evil, and evil is good. We who are born again are considered to be ignorant, intolerant, narrow-minded, hateful bigots, who must be silenced. And believe me, if they could silence us right now, if they could get away with us, they'd either put us in camps or they'd kill us outright if they thought they could get away with it. There will come a time during the reign of the Antichrist when that's exactly what he does. He kills everybody who won't worship him. 
In 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, Paul writes, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Active persecution should not take us by surprise. If the Lord should delay his return for us in the rapture much longer, we will probably find ourselves actively persecuted, as are our brothers and sisters in Christ throughout almost the rest of the whole world, every place. Christians are being persecuted. Not everywhere, but mostly everywhere. Then we may be called upon by God to once again have all things in common. It may be necessary for our survival. Our attitude always should be that what we possess is not our own. Everything that we have is a gift from God. Our abilities, talents, even our very bodies. We are the temporary stewards of God's resources. The possessions of this world should have a very light hold on us. We should be willing to give them up as God calls us. So if you see or hear of someone in need, answer that need. Don't say to your brother or sister, Oh, I'm so sorry that you've lost your job, your home, and that you have no food. I'll be praying for you. Be warm. Be filled. What good is that? We should be willing to help not only fellow believers, but our unbelieving neighbors as well. And who is my neighbor? Anyone that God brings across your path. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? What better way is there to demonstrate the truth of your, cons- your conversion and the love of God to someone than to lovingly meet their need. If you have the resources, do something about it. If someone is homeless and you have room, open your home to them. When you do this, you'll be opening yourself up to being hurt and used. But I'd rather take the risk demonstrating grace rather than turning down someone who's in real need. You must also be wise in prayer Pray, excuse me, prayfully in how you use your resources. If you have a brother or sister that continues to use their resources foolishly or refuse to work, then maybe a little hardship will set them straight. There should be no freeloading among us Christians. That includes scamming or taking advantage of the government for public assistance, unemployment, and welfare. Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order, if anyone is not willing to work, then he's not to eat either. Got to pull your own weight if you're able. You know, there are those who are truly in need and can't, can't work. That's a different case. Our fellowship is not only to be shared with one another, but also with the very God of creation. John stresses the distinct person, persons of the Godhead when he states that our fellowship is indeed with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Not specifically stated, but implied is that our fellowship is only possible through God's Holy Spirit, who lives in us. So through our fellowship, John gives us a concept of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three distinct distinct persons, one God. Just think of it. We have an intimate, personal love relationship with the God of the universe. Look out at the sky at night when it's clear, and look at all those stars out there. There's, There's billions of galaxies with billions of stars in each one of them, And God made it all out of nothing with just a word. Incredible. Our fellowship with God as well as our fellowship with each other consists of a sharing, a communion, a common bond, and a life. We need no intermediary, no minister, no teacher, no guru, no priest to approach God. 
Paul in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 tells us, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. God loves us so much. He died for us. He tells that, us that in his word in Romans 8, 35 through 39, when he says, when Paul says, Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, For your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This love of God, this blessed fellowship that we all have, allows us to have our joy be made full. This godly joy that we experience through our fellowship with God is not like the joy or happiness of the world. The happiness that is in the world is dependent upon external circumstances while the deep, abiding joy of God exists despite our circumstances because it's based on God. For example, it's easy to be happy when everything's going well. You have that great job, a fantastic wife or husband, wonderful children, great home, new car, and you just won the lotto. Are you happy? Of course you are. Everything's going great. This is the happiness of the world. It is dependent on circumstances. But how do you feel when you lose your job? You're having marital difficulties. You find out that your kids are using drugs. Your car breaks down and you don't have the money to fix it. You have to, comp you have to declare bankruptcy and your dog just died. Are you happy? No. Gone is the happiness of the world. Everything's going wrong for you, and now the world says that it's time for you to join the rest of us by getting a prescription for Prozac. By the way, every time I see an advertisement on TV for these antidepressant drugs and listen to their possible side effects, I'm at a loss as to why someone would ever risk taking them. The side effects are worse than the depression that the drug is supposed to treat. Oh yes, we will take care of your depression, but beware of the physical effects as well as those bizarre behaviors and suicidal thoughts that may be produced by using our drugs. All of this is in fine print, of course, along with a legal disclaimer. Now, not even as a born-again Christian are you going to be happy in these circumstances, especially not if your dog dies. But can you still have joy? Yes, despite bad circumstances, you can still have the joy of the Lord. Because our joy is based not on our circumstances, but in God, our rock. The way to overcome depression is to praise the Lord and give thanks to him in all things. Even though bad things will happen to you as a Christian, and you might not understand why God is allowing these things, we are told that we should trust in God. He always has what is best for you in mind. Remember, God never promised us that we'll always be happy in this life. Remember that old song, I beg your pardon? I never promised you a rose garden? That's kind of what it's like to be a Christian. God never promised us a rose garden. He never said it was going to be easy. God's more concerned with our holiness than our happiness. 
God's plans have eternity in mind, so sometimes we're not going to understand what God's doing. Just as Job, a God-fearing man, did not understand why all that he had was taken from him, but God meant it for his good. Paul writes in Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. This is God's promise to the believer. You can have peace and joy in this world. If God's for us, who can be against us? Verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Notice that John is not giving his opinion. The things that he says were revealed to him by God himself. That God is light is emblematic of his purity, perfection, and goodness. Ivory soap advertises itself as 99 and 44, 100% pure, but God is 100% light. In him there is not even a hint of darkness. Where there is light, there can be no darkness. Light casts out darkness, and light has no fellowship with darkness. Sin is rebellion and darkness, and God cannot abide sin. Verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. There are some people who claim to know and have fellowship with God and yet they walk in darkness. They think that they have a relationship with him that they do not have. They deny the word of God while professing to know him. Remember, when Jesus said there's going to be a lot of people saying, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do this? Didn't we do this for you? We prophesied and we healed in your name. And what does Jesus say to them? Be gone from me. I never knew you. All the followers of the world's false religions, Islam, Buddhism, Confucianism, Hinduism, and what, however other many false religions there are, the Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, Roman Catholics, and apostate Protestants are among these. Some may complain, who am I to judge? Aren't you be, being extremely harsh in the condemnation of these billions of people? Billion with B. Billions. But it's not I who judge them. It's the Holy Scriptures. Jesus said in John 3, chapter 3, verse 18, He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I've been working on a study for Good Friday, and... You know, like, and what Jesus went through, dying on the cross, freely he did this of his own will. This wasn't an accident of history. This was a preordained plan of God. And all that he went through, he did it because he loves us. And then there's that scripture that says, you know, to those who have rejected Jesus, what he did for us, that there's no, there's no hope for them. You know, how much more are they going to be held accountable by God who, who step on and, and, and disregard the precious shed blood of Christ that is the only thing that could forgive them from their sins? Psalm 
Some may protest, don't all these people claim to believe in Jesus? Some do. Jehovah Witness would say they believe in Jesus. Mormon would say, hey, we believe in Jesus. A Roman Catholic, sure, we believe in Jesus. But their faith is not in Jesus as revealed in the scriptures. Theirs is a different Jesus, a false Christ of their own making. They do not believe the scriptures. These groups of people either deny the deity of Jesus Christ or they attempt to add works to the true gospel of salvation by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. They are rebels. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus warns us to inspect the fruit of those who claim to be believers. He says, so then, you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I then will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I just said that before, didn't I? Many people who claim to know Jesus, many people will claim to know Jesus, but the Jesus that they believe is a false Jesus. He is not the Jesus revealed through the word of God. Rather, their belief is based upon the false teachings of men or the vain imaginations of their own heart. Many believe that they're good people and that surely God will accept them for their good works. Is there anybody really like that? Is anybody a good person? The scripture says not even one. No one is good, not even one. Some believe that Jesus was just a good man, a teacher, an angel, a spirit, or a prophet. Others believe that there are many ways to God. Multitudes deny the deity of Jesus. Still others say that my God would never send so many people to hell. In believing these things, they deny the scriptures, making God out to be a liar by refusing to accept God's holy word. They have chosen damnation for themselves. God's desire is for all to be saved, but we all have a free choice to make. He sends no one to hell. We can choose God's way and have eternal life with him in heaven, or we can persist in our own stubborn pride, thus choosing eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. There is no oblivion. You just don't, not, you die and you don't exist. We're all going to live eternally, but our address is determined by our own choices. So what about you? Do you prefer smoking or non-smoking? The non-believer who habitually walks in darkness as a pattern of living or preferred lifestyle is spiritually dead. If they do not repent, they will spend eternity apart from God in the lake of fire. If one claims to be a Christian having fellowship with Jesus and the fruits of your life do not reflect this, then you're either self-deceived or a liar. For example, we have several prominent politicians in our nation who claim to be Christian because it is politically expedient to do so. Yet they consistently lie and dissemble with the ease and skill that comes from a lifetime of practice. As with sugar on their tongues, they deceive the unknowing and the unwary. They distort the truth. They make the good seem evil and the evil seem good. The legislation that they author and support and the actions that they take are ungodly in the extreme such as normalizing homosexuality, abortion on demand, redefining marriage, seizure and redistribution of wealth, 
also know when it's theft, selective enforcement of existing laws, removing God from all public venues, political correctness in place of the truth, etc. Are the leaders who support or who want to adopt such things Christian? No matter what they say, no way. They have proved that they are not Christians by their bad fruit. They are either self-deceived or purposeful liars. Jesus said that you'll know them, know the true believers by their good fruits. Though we as Christians do not trust in man for salvation, we do still live in this world. As citizens, we have a stake in wanting to live in a country that is governed as righteously as is possible by man. So we vote. Get informed. We try to choose the best candidate we can. I can't believe I actually had a vote for McCain or Romney back in the day. But what was the choice? Barack Obama. But know this. No true Christian should support or vote for any candidate or party that stands for such great evils as abortion on demand, the forced redistribution of wealth, which I said is theft, and it is, redefining marriage as anything other than the union of a man and a woman, or the legalization and normalization of the sexual sins of homosexuality, lesbianism, transgenderism, pedophilia, etc. I don't see how any Christian can possibly vote for any Democrat for any office except maybe dog catcher, maybe. For the true born-again Christian, the issue of walking in darkness is not one of salvation. A Christian may temporarily walk in darkness, though fellowship with God will be broken, yet they are still saved. A true born-again, regenerated Christian will find that it's impossible for them to habitually walk in darkness. I mean, you guys know what I'm talking about when you sin, purposely sin, and we do sometimes. How do you feel when you do that? Maybe at the time, okay, your, fl your flesh is gratified, but then afterwards what happens? Satan condemns you, you know, you're... He tries to condemn you. You know, you, you feel terrible, don't you? You can't, as a Christian, if you're really born again, you can't live that way for that long. You've got to be driven to your knees. As a non-believer until the age of 25, I know firsthand the temporary pleasures that walking in darkness can bring. It cannot be denied. A life of sin has its pleasures. Otherwise, we would not be tempted by sin to do it. For a time, you can feel free to gratify your flesh, and eventually, even your pangs of guilt will disappear. Your conscience will be seared as with a hot iron. You will not believe it or realize it, but you are a slave to sin and corruption. You find that you are always seeking new and novel ways to satisfy the lusts of the flesh, each more debasing than the last. You are on a downward spiral to the pit of hell. Remember that one-third of the holy angels who dwelt in the very presence of God have been transformed into demonic beings through sin, rebellion, and time. The lake of fire was created for them, but you will join them there for eternity if you persist in your own personal rebellion. I'm going to start to wind this up with this. I will close with this confession. Yes, I walked and even delighted myself in the lust of the flesh for the first 25 years of my life. I knew a little bit about God because of my Catholic upbringing, but I did not know God as my Savior. I was ignorant of the true gospel of salvation by faith alone, through Christ alone, by grace alone. I thought that I was a good person and that my good works 
would suffice for my entrance to heaven. You know, after all, I wasn't a murderer or anything like that. No way was a good God going to send me to hell. But I was lost, walking in darkness, a slave to sin. But God, through a series of circumstances, personally taught me the gospel from his word. I got myself a Bible that I had to have as a textbook, believe it or not, for a college class that I was attending while I was stationed in Hawaii on shore duty. So I got, I had a Bible. I had to have one. I had to buy one. And God, through a, God personally taught me the gospel from his word. I, you know, I had, I actually read part of it. And wow, my eyes were open. God showed me great mercy and I got saved through the blessed, the precious blood of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I didn't know what being born again was. I didn't know what that was. But later on, when I became more knowledgeable and I read about being born again and how it happened, I did that. God did that to me. I had no, no teaching. I never heard that. I might have heard somebody, as an insult, call somebody, you know, a born-again nutcase. But I didn't know what being born again was. But God taught me what it was. My conscience being no longer seared, I saw myself for what I truly was, a wretched sinner saved by the grace of God. Now I am convicted when I sin. Not condemned, but convicted. Conviction drives you to your knees in confession. And so God can cleanse you with his blood. You can deal with that. No longer can I take lasting pleasure in sin. No longer do I habitually walk in darkness. I have a change in nature. I am a new man, born again through the Spirit of the living God. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the worship, the fellowship. Through your word, Lord, your word is powerful, more powerful than any two-edged sword, as the scriptures say, more powerful than any weapon. And it will not leave your mouth without accomplishing the purpose for what it was intended. We pray you would use your word tonight, Lord, to help us to change, modify our behaviors where we need to, Lord. Uh, you know where we're all at, and we know where we're all at, and we just pray that we would be blessed by hearing what you had to say about all these things tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.